Hello everybody, my name is Kevin and I am the non-traditional Catholic. This is episode one of Arguments Against the Veridicality of the Catholic Church. I'm starting this series as a collection of video essays that will uh, explain why I'm not Catholic and maybe why you will want to consider also not being Catholic. This episode is titled The Argument from the Historicity of Juan Diego. I'm going to start every episode with the syllogism, and then I will defend each premise and conclusion of each syllogism to uh, defend my position. The syllogism here is a little bit long, but bear with me, I don't think it's that hard to follow, though some of the points might be contentious. Premise 1, Juan Diego was canonized by the Catholic Church in 2002, which is after the year 1170. Premise 2, the Church considers all canonizations after the year 1170 to be infallible. Conclusion, the Church says that Juan Diego was canonized infallibly. Premise 3, if the Church canonizes someone, the Church is claiming that that person existed. Premise 1 again, Juan Diego was canonized by the Catholic Church, so the conclusion uh, for this second portion of the syllogism is that the Church is infallibly claiming that Juan Diego existed. So far, I don't think that any of this is contentious, except for perhaps the infallibility of the saints, but that's for another episode. Premise 4. If there is insufficient evidence for the historicity of Juan Diego, then the Church is demanding her members believe something without sufficient evidence. This is a tautology, um, and I don't think that this itself is going to be contentious. However, premise 5, there is insufficient evidence for the historicity of Juan Diego. Uh, I was Catholic for many years and never really learned about the other side of the Juan Diego myth. Um, but in this video essay, I'm going to dive into that. This is uh, the only bolded premise because this is going to be by far the most contentious. Um, and I will spend by far the most time defending this premise. Conclusion, therefore, the church is demanding her members believe something without sufficient evidence. And then finally, if the church is demanding her members believe something without sufficient evidence, then there is good reason to think that the Catholic Church is not the one true church. This might be contentious, but I think that it stands to reason that if a uh, church claiming to be the one true church is asking you to believe something and they don't have enough evidence for it, then that's good reason to be suspicious. Conclusion 3 restated the church is demanding her members believe something without sufficient evidence. Therefore, conclusion 4, the final conclusion. Therefore, there is good reason to think that the Catholic Church is not the one true church. Perhaps premise 6 is contentious. I'm not going to spend too much time defending that one, as I think that that is self-evident. Um, but I'll be happy to go into that more in a future video if I have to. Okay, I'm going to breeze through the first couple premises because I don't think that they're that contentious, and then I'll spend a lot of time on the historicity of Juan Diego. Premise 1, Juan Diego was canonized by the Catholic Church in 2002. Here's his official canonization um, document from the Vatican, uh, the canonization of Juan Diego um, in 2002 by Pope John Paul II. No, no need to read this whole thing, but uh, he was indeed officially canonized. Um, and you don't have to take my word for that. Premise two, the church calls all canonizations after the year 1170 infallible. I will defend this more in a future video if I must. However, the opinion of the majority of Catholic scholars is that all canonizations, especially those after the year 1170, are infallible. I'm only going to choose one line of evidence to back up this premise because otherwise the entire video would be me defending the infallibility of the canonization of the saints. Uh, but I'm going to present what I think is the strongest evidence. And that would be a document put out by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, the CDF, which is part of the Ordinary Magisterium. From this uh, document, linked down here, with regard to those truths connected to revelation by historical necessity and which are to be held definitively, the following examples can be given. The canonization of saints. And then in parentheses, dogmatic facts. Now, go ahead and read this whole thing. But if I was going to phrase this in my own words, it would say something like this. The canonization of saints are to be held definitively. But you will notice over here that it says uh, that uh, they are not able to be declared as divinely revealed. So I don't really care if it's divinely revealed or not. What I care about is whether or not that's infallible. If the church is wrong about something that's infallible, that would, that would falsify the church. So where did I pull this from? I pulled it from the Vatican website, from an actual CDF document. Um, uh, here's the full document. 
Um, we're not going to read the whole thing together, but what I will do quickly is just control F for uh, canonization. And um, here it is. With regard to those truths connected to revelation by historical necess uh, necessity and which are to be held definitively, the following examples could be given. The canonization of saints among that uh, list of examples of things which are to be held definitively. Um, uh, notably, uh, the CDF is calling the canonization of saints something that's like a an example of a moral doctrine, which is taught by the ordinary magisterium. Um, so, and the CDF is declaring that um, the canonization of saints is just as infallible as the fact that fornication is a sin. So this is pretty certain in my opinion. Now there is debate. I don't want to mischaracterize it. And probably the most, um, in my opinion, there's really only two ways to attack my argument. Um, that would be to attack the, can the infallible status of the canonization of the saints. But then the other way would be just to debate the actual historicity of Juan Diego. Um, so I'm going to keep moving on. But uh, I do understand that um, there is a possibility that someone would be able to attack my argument um, based on their belief that canonizations are not infallible. So um, moving on, the conclusion from these two premises, assuming the truth of premise two, is that the church says that Juan Diego was canonized infallibly. Moving on. Premise three. If the church canonizes someone, the church is claiming that that person existed. Put in another way, souls had to have once belonged to a real human. Um, I don't have any um, documents from the church to back this up or anything, but this, this is true. Um, the church would never canonize someone that they didn't think historically existed because there are no souls that once that never belonged to a human body. So uh, debate me on this one if you want, but I don't think that this is contentious. Premise one restated, Juan Diego was canonized. The conclusion from this is that the church is infallibly claiming that Juan Diego existed. Here we go. Premise four. If there is insufficient evidence for the historicity of Juan Diego, then the church is demanding that her members believe something without sufficient evidence. The below is taken from a Reddit post that I made. I've been fairly active on the Debate a Catholic subreddit for a while now, a couple of years. Um, and I did a whole write-up, which kind of spawned this video essay. Um, so this is taken from the subreddit Debate a Catholic um, from, a, wrote, from, a, from a, uh, a post that I wrote that I titled, It is Reasonable to Doubt the Veridicality of the Operation of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Um, the focus of this video is uh, more modest in scope. It is only on the history of the city of Juan Diego himself. The two are intertwined, so I will touch on it, but um, I'm going to spend a decent amount of time defending the premise that there is insufficient evidence to um, believe that Juan Diego existed as a real historical person. It is not clear to me that Juan Diego was a real person. I am not the only person who thinks this. Even Catholic scholars doubt, including Monsignor Schulenberg. Born in 1916, Schulenberg was the abbot of the Basilica of Guadalupe, the second most visited Catholic shrine in the world um, by the Pope in 1963, but Schulenberg was forced to resign from his post when he was 80 years old in 1996. Why? Because he was quoted saying that Juan Diego was a symbol, not a reality, and that his canonization would be the recognition of a cult not the recognition of a physical, real existence of a person. The timing here is important. Schulenberg said this in 1996. Juan Diego wasn't canonized until 2002. Juan Diego was beatified in the 90s, and so Schulenberg was, talking, was speaking out against his canonization on the grounds that he didn't actually exist. Let's find a news article that uh, is actually from this time. So this is an, a news article from December of 1999. Mexican tradition caught in uproar over doubting priest. This priest, of course, is actually Monsignor uh, Schulenberg. Um, uh, and uh, this mentions that Schulenberg at age 83, who ran the Basilica for 33 years, has written to the Vatican to oppose Juan Diego's sainthoods, citing doubts as to whether or not he actually existed. 
Oh, and so note that Juan Diego was beatified in 1990. So Schulenberg was thinking about this for many years and um, aired his concerns prior to Juan Diego's actual canonization, though it was after his beatification. So a Monsignor from the 1990s, uh, his opinion on whether or not Juan Diego existed doesn't actually mean much. It's not very elucidating by itself, but the timing of Schulenberg's doubts is pertinent. Juan Diego was beatified in 1990, canonized in 2020, so Schulenberg was airing his concerns while the Vatican was investigating the life and miracles of Juan Diego. Let's explore the reasons why Schulenberg doubted, because again, the fact that he doubted doesn't matter much, but why he doubted is going to matter. Bishop Zumaraga, the bishop who Juan Diego supposedly brought the tilma to, was a real historical person. We have his writings, and we have records of him. In fact, Bishop Zumaraga wrote the first book ever to be published in the, in the Western Hemisphere, Doctrina Breve, in 1539. We have a lot of his writings, and Juan Diego never mentions... I'm sorry, Zumaraga never mentions Juan Diego. Despite the fact that in the actual Juan Diego myth, Juan Diego brings the tilma to, to Bishop Zumaraga. Let's find uh, an actual source for this. Archbishop Zumaraga never claimed that the miraculous visions had occurred, the popular story notwithstanding. He wrote extensively and warned his readers to beware of miracles claimed after the time of Jesus. He makes no mention of the tilma or Juan Diego. And here's just a source so that you know that I'm not making this up. Um, this is from a Catholic website as well. Um, so um, uh, I think it's just interesting that even this Catholic website is actually pointing out that um, uh, Bishop Zumaraga doesn't actually mention Juan Diego or the Tilma ever. So yes, this is an argument from silence, which I understand has problems, but you would think that the man who's in the story, who's in a real historical person, would have mentioned something as big as Juan Diego bringing the tilma to him. Archbishop Zumaraga isn't the only person who should have mentioned Juan Diego or the tilma and either didn't, or we actually have something worse than just not mentioning it at all. Franciscan con contemporaries of Zumaraga talked about a Marian cult that resulted from the conquistador conquest of Tenochtitlan. A Franciscan fray named Francisco de Bustamante publicly condemned the cult of Our Lady of Guadalupe outright precisely because it was centered on a painting which, according to Fray Bustamante, was painted yesterday by an Indian, to which the locals were attributing miraculous powers. Bustamante referred to the cult object in the Shrine of Guadalupe as an image, but more frequently as a painting. Four witnesses relayed Bustamante's charge that the image was painted by an Indian, and the two recalled the name of the artist as Marcos. Bustamante was relating that the image was not miraculous, but was in fact a physical painting, and that it was absurd to input power to this cult image. Um, I won't read this entire uh uh, block quote here. We will visit the website really quick just because I think that um, finding um, sources is important. Um, but um, the vitriol with which Bustamante condemned the Marian cult was so um, intense and um, the local bishop um, uh, launched an investigation into Bustamante's condemnation of the Marian cult. So um, the Marian cult was well known to the Catholic Church at the time. However, Bishop Zumaraga, who's in the story, never mentions Juan Diego, and Fray Bustamante writes about a Marian cult who painted an image. It gets worse. Another Franciscan, Fray Bernardino de Sahagún, expressed deep reservations to the Marian cult at Tepayac. Tepayac is where Guadalupe occurred, um, without mentioning the cult image at all. So both um, Sahagún and Bustamante were writing in that 1550 to 1590 range. Um, note that the apparition allegedly occurred in 1531. So we're already at like, you know, 20 years um, to like 50 years after the fact um, already. And so the, the timing is already off. Um, but pretty much as soon as this cult springs up, it's being, it's being condemned. Um, 
and the, the cult doesn't pop up until 20 years after these events supposedly occur. So, at this place, namely Tepayak, the Indians, and again, this is Sahagun writing, had a temple dedicated to the mother of the gods, whom they called, and I will screw up a lot of the um, the Mexican native pronunciations, but um, that, that's who they called their god, which means our mother. There they performed many sacrifices in honor of this goddess, and now that a church of Our Lady of Guadalupe is bil being built there, they also call her the same name, being motivated by the preachers who called Our Lady the Mother of God. So they're using like their pagan god name for Our Lady. Um, it is not known for certain where the beginnings of this pagan goddess may have originated, but we know for certain that from its first usage, the word means that ancient goddess of local pagan origin. Um, we should be correcting this name to like Holy Mary, Mother of God, not this pagan god. Um, this pagan god appears to be a satanic invention. So you can see that um, Sahagun was not a fan of the Marian dogmas, but doesn't even, I'm not I'm sorry, the, the Marian cults, but he never actually mentions Juan Diego ever, and he doesn't mention um, any kind of image. Um, so the, um, my source on this one is just the Wikipedia article on Sahagun, but Wikipedia quotes the uh, Florentine Codex, which is a piece of writing from Sahagun, page 90. I don't have access to the whole codex, but um, Wikipedia quotes it, um, and Wikipedia is a pretty good source. So, um, so we have, you know, between 20 to like 50 and 60 years after the supposed events of the Juan Diego myth, uh, we have public, um, uh, condemnation of the Marian cult of Tepayac, but we have no mention of Juan Diego. And the only mention of the Tilma is that it's a fake. The first details of Juan Diego's life emerge in 1648, 100 plus years after the supposed apparition. The first known telling of this tale appeared in a book published in Spanish in 1648 by the priest Miguel Sanchez. Sanchez has a few scattered sentences noting Juan Diego's uneventful life at the hermitage in the 16 years from the apparitions until his death. Here's another quote from Wikipedia. Um, but this quote essentially just says that um, the first details uh, come in 1648 from Miguel, uh, I'm sorry, from uh, uh, Sanchez. Um, and again, I'm quoting Juan Diego, I'm quoting Wikipedia here, but um, Wikipedia is quoting um, Stafford Poole, who is actually a Catholic scholar. Um, and I will speak more about um, Stafford Poole um, in a few minutes. On the heels of the Sanchez version of the story, um, the myth of Juan Diego was included in the, in the book, and I, I'm not going to try to pronounce this, but um, it's the local Mexican tongue, um, and I think it means something to the effect of the great event. Yes, down here, the great event. Um, in the great event, there's some information concerning the life of Juan Diego. Uh, so the second oldest published account is known from the opening words of the long title, The Great Event. It was published in the local Mexican language um, before Spanish. Um, by the then vicar of the hermitage of at Guadalupe in 1649. Um, the work comprises several elements, include, including a brief biography of Juan Diego and famously a highly wrought and ceremonious account of the apparitions. Uh, but again, nothing about Juan Diego until over 100 years after the event supposedly happened, about 100 years from when he was supposed to die. And then we start getting um, actual written accounts of the... Um, apparition story. So uh, the image of Our Lady comes first and the story and the mythos surrounding it come after. More substantial details. Oh, and again, this came from Stafford Poole, the Catholic scholar. Substantial details about the life of Juan Diego emerge in 1666, written in a piece of writing called the Becerra Tonko. Uh, oh, sorry, by Becerra Tonko. Tonko opens his prologue by mentioning the Church of Mexico's judicial inquiry in early 1666 into the apparition of Mary at Tepayac um, and the origin of her miraculous image at Guadalupe. The investigation found no authentic documents on the matter in the ecclesiastical archives, so the author felt obligated to put in writing what I knew by memory and what I had read and examined in my adolescence in the pictures and characters of the Mexican Indians who were able persons of distinction in that primitive century. So, 
1666, we have a Spaniard writing from memory what he learned from the native Mexicans about Juan Diego. That's the most substantial uh, evidence that we have for the life of Juan Diego. It's not looking great. So let's examine the facts before I try to kind of steel man the history city of Juan Diego. Let's examine the facts that I've presented so far. And let's pretend that it's the mid-1990s before Juan Diego is canonized. Juan Diego has been beatified, but not canonized. We're investigating his historicity as part of the canonization process. We know that the first details of Juan Diego's life do not emerge until 100 plus years after the story takes place. And we also know that the very bishop who supposedly played a key part in the miracle story never mentions Juan Diego. Further, we know that the contemporaries of the time wrote about the, quote, Marian cults at Tepayac. All of this is painting a picture that there was a legend that grew out of the mixing of the Catholic Spaniards and the pagan natives and was passed down via oral tradition, at which point scholars attempted to fill in the gaps based on hearsay until enter the Codex Escalada. There is a reason why I'm saving this for when I am. The Codex Escalada is a sheet of parchment signed with the date of 1548 on which there has been drawn in ink and in the European style images with supporting native Mexican text depicting the Marian apparition of Our Lady of Guadalupe to Juan Diego, which allegedly occurred on four separate occasions in December 1531 on the hill of Tepayac, north of central Mexico City. The parchment first came to light in 1995 and in 2002 was named in honor of Father Savior Escalada, who brought it to public attention and when it was published in 1997. This codex, the Codex Escalada, is probably the most important thing that I'm going to mention in this write-up. Because if authentic, it destroys my argument. If authentic, and if correctly dated to the mid-16th century, as tests so far do seem to indicate, this document fills in a gap in the documentary record as to the antiquity of the tradition regarding those apparitions and the image of the Virgin associated with the fourth apparition, which is venerated at the Basilica of Guadalupe. So here's a link to the Wikipedia article on the Codex Escalada. Um, don't need to visit it, but... What is strange about this piece of parchment? So, first of all, um, the timing is really odd. So, Juan Diego was beatified in 1990. Between 1990 and 1997, it's not looking good for Juan Diego. Um, a lot of people are raising concerns about the actual historicity of the myth of, of Juan Diego. Um, they don't think that Juan Diego was a real historical person. Um, but then suddenly, in 1997, out of the blue, a priest publishes a document that was lost to history from 1548 until 1997. It's odd. Um, the piece was apparently donated by um, wealthy donors who just had this document in like a personal vault. Um, so that's a little weird. Um, but regardless, the parchment was analyzed by a team and that team did conclude that the document was indeed from the 1500s, the 16th century. Um, more interestingly, is that this document is supposedly signed by um, Sahagun. The same Sahagun, Frey Sahagun, who wrote so negatively about, um, about the Marian cult at Tepayac that... Um, that there was an investigation launched into him by the local bishop. So it would seem odd that um, Sahagun would sign the Codex Escalada, even though he was highly opposed to the Marian cult. So, and what is the Codex Escalada? It's just a sheet of paper that has a drawing on it of Juan Diego and Our Lady, and it says something to the effect of, like, Juan Diego lived a pious life and died when he was whatever age he was in whatever year it was. Um, that's it. That's all it says. It's essentially just a death certificate. So it's signed and dated by Sahagun in 1548, but then Sahagun is writing about the Marian cults at Tepayac in 76 and 77, like 30 years later. That makes no sense at all. If Sahagun was opposed to the Marian cults and was writing about this image that um, that he knew about 30 years ago, like why, why was he talking about how this image was painted yesterday if he knew that Our Lady gave it to Juan Diego 30 years ago? It makes no sense that Sahagun would have signed that. 
the uh, veridicality of this document is indeed contentious. One of the foremost scholars of the whole Guadalupe mythos, his name is Rafael Tena. And Rafael Tena contends that even if Sahagun's signature is authentic, its presence on the document as such can constitutes a serious internal inconsistency arising from Sahagun's known hostility towards the cult, the cult of Guadalupe. Other scholars have said that this is such like a convenient find that it would be like, let's say that um, somebody was debating like a Jesus mythicist and they pulled open a document um, and it was like a birth certificate of Jesus and it was like dated in the year zero and it was signed by the Blessed Virgin Mary and, uh, you know, St. Joseph. It's so outlandish that you, you, you'd look at it with a lot of suspicion because it's probably not real. It's probably not authentic anyway. Um, so um, the Codex Escalada, if authentic, would be like a slam dunk and it would, it would like destroy my case. Um, however, it's such a contentious piece that I don't think that the single Codex Escalada like outweighs um, the fact that without the Codex Escalada, which was lost to history until 1997, um, we have no evidence of Juan Diego's life until a um, hundred plus years after his death. His contemporaries never mentioned him. Bishop Zumarraga, who we have a ton of writings, never mentions him. I think that the evidential chips far favor the side of the Juan Diego story being a story that grew over time rather than it being a real historical event. So where are we today? Father Stafford Poole, who died in 2020 just recently, was a Catholic priest and, and research historian. I did quote him a few times up above. Um, he was formerly a professor of history and later served as the president of St. John's Seminary College in California. Additionally, he's known for his extensive writings about the historicity, uh, I'm sorry, the history of the Catholic Church in Mexico and the devotion to the Virgin of Guadalupe. Um, we can follow this link here, but I included a screenshot of the website below. The reason I am including a screenshot is because I don't have access to the full article, but luckily I was able to glean enough information from like the single page that they give us. Um, so um, Stafford Poole's study convincingly shows that the accepted version of Guadalupe's apparition developed over time from uns unsubstantiated oral history, hopeful interpretation, and pious fraud. So. I feel confident in premise five. There is sufficient evidence for the hi there's insufficient evidence for the historicity of Juan Diego. Conclusion. Therefore, the church is demanding that her members believe something without sufficient evidence. If the church is demanding her members believe something without sufficient evidence, then there is good reason to think that the Catholic Church is not the one true church. The church is demanding that her members believe something without sufficient evidence. Therefore, there is good reason to think that the Catholic Church is not the one true church. I'll end there. I look forward to engaging in the comments with anybody who wants to uh, debate any of this with me. Um, and I'd love to have anybody on who wants to debate this with me. Um, I look forward to having a robust discussion with anybody who will uh, be willing to listen. Um, and until then, thank you very much for your time. This has been episode one of Arguments Against the Veridicality of the Catholic Church. Uh, I've been your host, Kevin, the non-traditional Catholic. And until next time.